is part two of Neil Gaiman's Truth is a Cave in the Black Mountains. I have slept in the homes of the poor, and I have slept in palaces, and I have slept beneath the stars, and would have told you before that night that all places were one to me. But I woke before first light, convinced we had to be gone from that place, but not knowing why. And I woke Callum by putting a finger to his lips, and silently we left that croft on the mountainside without saying our farewells and I have never been more pleased to be gone from anywhere. We were a mile from the place when I said, The island. You asked if it would be there. Surely an island is there or it is not there. Kellum hesitated. He seemed to be weighing his words. And then he said, The misty isle is not as other places, and the mist that surrounds it is not like other mists. We walked down a path worn by hundreds of years of sheep and deer and few enough men. He said, they also call it the Winged Isle. Some say it is because the island, if seen from above, would look like butterfly wings. And I do not know the truth of it. Then, and what is truth? And jesting, pilot. It is harder coming down than it is going up. I thought about it. Sometimes I think that truth is a place. In my mind, it is like a city. There can be a hundred roads, a thousand paths that will all take you eventually to the same place. It does not matter where you come from. If you walk toward the truth, you will reach it whatever path you take. Kellen McGinnis looked down at me and said nothing. Then, you're wrong. The truth is a cave in the Black Mountains. There is one way there, and one only. And that way is treacherous and hard. And if you choose the wrong path, you will die alone on the mountainside. We crested the ridge, and we looked down to the coast. I could see villages below beside the water, and I could see high black mountains before me on the other side of the sea, coming out of the mist. Callum said, there's your cave in those mountains. The bones of the earth, I thought, seeing them. And then I became uncomfortable thinking of bones, and to distract myself, I said, and how many times is it you've been there? Only once, he hesitated. I searched for it all my sixteenth year, for I had heard the legends, and I believed that if I sought, I should find. I was seventeen when I reached it, and came back with all the gold coins I could carry. And were you not frightened of the curse? When I was young, I was afraid of nothing. What did you do with your gold? A portion I buried, and I alone know where. The rest I used as a bride price for the woman I loved, and I built a fine house with it. He stopped, as if he had already said too much. There was no ferryman at the jetty, only a small boat, hardly big enough for three full-sized men, tied to a tree trunk on the shore, twisted and half dead, and a bell beside it. I sounded the bell, and soon enough a fat man came down the shore. He said to Callum, It'll cost you a shilling for the ferry, and your boy three pennies. I stood tall. I am not as big as other men are, but I have as much pride as any of them. I am also a man, I said. I'll pay your shilling. The ferryman looked me up and down. Then he scratched his beard. I beg your pardon. My eyes are not what they once were. I shall take you to the island. I handed him a shilling. He weighed it in his hand. That's nine pence you did not cheat me out of. Nine pennies are a lot of money in this dark age. The water was the color of slate, although the sky was blue, and white caps chased one another across the water's surface. He untied the boat and hauled it rattling, down the shingle to the water. We waded out into the cold water and clambered inside. The splash of oars on seawater, and the boat propelled forward in easy movements. I sat closest to the ferryman. I said, nine pence. It is good wages. But I have heard of a cave in the mountains on the misty isle, filled with gold coins, the treasure of the ancients. He shook his head dismissively. Callum was staring at me, lips pressed together so hard they were white. I ignored him and asked the man again. A cave filled with golden coins, a gift from the Norsemen or the Southerners or those who say, say they were here long before any of us, those who fled into West as the people came. Heard of it, said the ferryman. Heard also of the curse of it. I reckon that the one can take care of the other. He spat into the sea. Then he said, You're an honest man, dwarf. I see it in your face. Do not seek this cave. No good can come of it. I am sure you are right, I told him, without guile. I am certain I am, he said, for not every day is it that I take a reaver and a little dwarfy man to the misty isle. And then he said, in this part of the world it is not considered lucky to talk about those that went to the west. 
we rode the rest of the boat journey in silence. <clears throat> Though the sea became choppier, and the waves splashed into the side of the boat, such that I held on with both hands for fear of being swept away. After what seemed like half a lifetime, the boat was tied to the long jetty of black stones. We walked the jetty as the waves crashed around us, the salt spray kissing our faces. There was a hump-backed man at the landing selling oat cakes and plums dried until they were almost stones. I gave him a penny and filled my jerkin pockets with them. We walked on to the misty aisle. I am old now, or at least I am no longer young, and everything I see reminds me of something else I've seen, such that I see nothing for the first time. A bonny girl, her hair fiery red, reminds me only of another hundred such lasses, and their mothers, and what they were as they grew, and what they looked like when they died. It is the curse of age that all things are reflections of other things. I say that, but my time on the misty isle, that is so called by the wise the winged isle, reminds me of nothing but itself. It is a day from that jetty until you reach the Black Mountains. Callum McGinnis looked at me, half his size or less, and he set off at a loping stride as if challenging me to keep up. His legs propelled him across the ground, which was wet, and all ferns and heather. Above us, low clouds were scuttling, gray and white and black, hiding each other and revealing and hiding again. I let him get ahead of me, let him press on into the rain till he was swallowed by the wet gray haze. Then, and only then, I ran. This is one of the secret things of me, the things I have not revealed to any person save to Morag, my wife, and Johnny and James, my sons, and Flora, my daughter. May the shadows rest her poor soul. I can run, and I can run well, and if I need to, I can run faster and longer and more sure-footedly than any man full-sized. And it was like this that I ran then, through the mist and the rain, taking to the high ground and the black rock ridges, yet keeping below the skyline. He was ahead of me, but I spied him soon, for I ran on and ran past him, on the high ground with the brow of the hill between us. Below us was a stream. I can run for days without stopping. That is the first of my three secrets, and one secret I have revealed to no man. We had discussed already where we would camp that first night on the Misty Isle, and Callum had told me we would spend the night beneath the rock that is called the Man and the Dog for it is said that it looks like an old man and his dog side by side, and I reached it late in the afternoon. There was a shelter beneath the rock, which was protected and dry, and some of those who had been before had left us firewood behind, sticks and twigs and branches. I made a fire and dried myself in front of it and took the chill from my bones. The wood smoke blew out across the heather. It was dark when Callum loped into the shelter and looked at me as if he had not expected to see me that side of midnight. I said, what took you so long, Callum McInnes? He said nothing, only stared at me. I said, there's trout, boiled in mountain water and a fire to warm your bones. He nodded. We ate the trout, drank whiskey to warm ourselves. There was a mound of heather and of ferns, dried and brown, piled high in the rear of the shelter, and we slept upon that, wrapped tight in our damp cloaks. I woke in the night. There was cold steel against my throat, the flat of the blade, not the edge. I said, and why would you ever kill me in the night, Callum McKinnis? For our way is long and our journey is not yet over. He said, I do not trust you, dwarf. It is not me you must trust, I told him, but those that I serve. And if you left with me but returned without me, there are those who will know the name of Callum McKinnis and cause it to be spoken in the shadows. The cold blade remained at my throat. He said, how did you get ahead of me? And here was I, repaying ill with good, for I made you food in a fire. I am a hard man to lose, Callum McInnes, and it is ill becomes a guide to do as you did today. Now take your dirk from my throat and let me sleep. He said nothing, but after a few moments the blade was removed. I forced myself neither to sigh nor to breathe, hoping he could not hear my heart pounding in my chest, and I slept no more that night. For breakfast I made porridge and threw in some dried plums to soften them. The mountains were black and gray against the white of the sky. We saw eagles, huge and ragged of wings, circling above us. Callum set a sober pace and I walked beside him, taking two steps for every one of his. How long? I asked him. A day, perhaps two. It depends on the weather. If the clouds come down, then two days or even three. 
The clouds came down at noon, and the world was blanketed by a mist that was worse than rain. Droplets of water hung in the air, soaked our clothes and our skin. The rocks we walked upon became treacherous, and Caleb and I slowed in our ascent, stepped carefully. We were walking up the mountain, not climbing, up goat paths and craggy, sharp ways. The rocks were black and slippery. We walked and climbed and clambered and clung. We slipped and slid and stumbled and staggered, and even in the mist, Callum knew where he was going, and I followed him. He paused at a waterfall that splashed across our path, thick as the trunk of an oak. He took the thin rope from his shoulders, wrapped it about a rock. This is not what, this was not here before, he told me. I'll go first. He tied one end of the rope about his waist and edged out along the path, into the falling water, pressing his body against the wet rock face, edging slowly, intently through the sheet of water. I was scared for him, scared for both of us, holding my breath as he passed, only breathing when he was on the other side of the waterfall. He tested the rope, pulled on it, motioned me to follow him, when a rock gave way beneath his foot, and he slipped on the wet rock and fell into the abyss. The rope held, and the rock beside me held. Callum McInnes dangled from the end of the rope. He looked up at me, and I sighed, anchored myself by a slab of crag, and I wound and pulled him up and up. I hauled him back onto the path, dripping and cursing. He said, you're stronger than you look, and I cursed myself for a fool. He must have seen it on my face, for after he shook himself, like a dog sending droplets flying, he said, my boy Callum told me the tale you told him about the Campbells coming for you and you being sent into the fields by your wife with them thinking she was your ma and you a boy. It was just a tale, I said, something to pass the time. Indeed, he said, for I heard tell of a raiding party of Campbells sent out a few years ago, seeking revenge on someone who had taken their cattle. They went, and they never came back. If a small fellow like you can kill a dozen Campbells, well, you must be strong, and you must be fast. I must be stupid, I thought ruefully, telling the child that tale. I had picked them off, one by one, like rabbits, as they came out to piss or to see what had happened to their friends. I had killed seven of them before my wife killed her first. We buried them in the glen, built a small cairn of stacking stones above them to weigh them down so their ghosts would not walk, and we were sad that Campbells had come so far to kill me that we had been forced to kill them in return. I take no joy in killing. No man should and no woman. Sometimes death is necessary, but it is always an evil thing. That is something I am in no doubt of, even after the events I speak of here. I took the rope from Callum McInnes and I clambered up and up over the rocks to where the waterfall came out of the side of the hill, and it was narrow enough for me to cross. It was slippery there, but I made it over without incident, tied the rope in place, came down it, threw the end of it to my companion, and walked him across. He did not thank me, neither for rescuing him nor for getting us across, and I did not expect thanks. I also did not expect what he actually said, though, which was, You are not a whole man, and you are ugly. Your wife, is she also small and ugly, like yourself? I decided to take no offense, whether offense had been intended or no. I simply said, She is not. She's a tall woman, almost as tall as you. And when she was young, when we were both younger, she was reckoned by some to be the most beautiful girl in the lowlands. The bards wrote songs praising her green eyes and her long, red-golden hair. I thought I saw him flinch at this, but it is possible that I imagined it, or more likely, wished to imagine I had seen it. How did you win her, then? I spoke the truth. I wanted her, and I get what I want. I did not give up. She said I was wise, and I was kind, and I would always provide for her, and I have. The clouds began to lower once more, and the world blurred at the edges, became softer. She said I would be a good father, and I have done my best to raise my children, who are also, if you're wondering, normal-sized. I beat sense into young Callum, said the older Callum. He is not a bad child. You can only do that so long as they are there with you, I said. And then I stopped talking, and I remembered that long year, and also I remembered Flora when she was small sitting on the floor with jam on her face, looking up at me as if I were the wisest man in the world. Ran away, eh? I ran away when I was a lad. I was twelve. I went as far as the court of the king over the water. 
the father of the current king. That's not something you hear spoken aloud. I am not afraid, he said. Not here. Who's to hear us, eagles? I saw him. He was a fat man who spoke the language of the foreigners well, and our own tongue only with difficulty. But he was still our king. He paused. And if he is to come to us again, he will need gold for vessels and weapons and to feed the troops that he raises. I said, so I believe. That is why we go in search of the cave. He said, this is bad gold. It does not come free. It has its cost. Everything has its cost. I was remembering every landmark. Climb at the sheep skull, cross the first three streams, then walk along the fourth until the five heaped stones and find where the rock looks like a seagull and walk on between two sharply jutting walls of black rock, and let the slope bring you with it. I could remember it, I knew, well enough to find my way home again, but the mists confused me, and I could not be certain. We, wa we reached a small loch high in the mountains and drank fresh water, caught huge white creatures that were not shrimps or lobsters or crayfish, and ate them raw like sausages, for we could not find any dry wood to make our fire that high. We slept on the wide ledge beside the icy water and woke into clouds before sunrise when the world was gray and blue. You were sobbing in your sleep, said Callum. I had a dream, I told him. I do not have bad dreams, Callum said. It was a good dream, I said. It was true. I had dreamed that Flora still lived. She was grumbling about the village boys and telling me of her time in the hills with the cattle and of things of no consequence smiling her great smile and tossing her hair the while, red golden like her mother's, although her mother's hair is now streaked with white. Good dreams should not make a man cry out like that, said Callum. A pause then. I have no dreams. Not good, not bad. No? Not since I was a young man. We rose. A thought struck me. Did you stop dreaming after you came to the cave? He said nothing. We walked along the mountainside into the mist as the sun came up. The mist seemed to thicken and fill with light in the sunshine, but it did not fade away and I realized that it must be a cloud. The world glowed, and then it seemed to me that I was staring at a man of my size, a small humpty man, his shadow, standing in the air in front of me like a ghost or an angel, and it moved as I moved. It was haloed by the light and shimmered, and I could not have told you now how near or far it was away. I have seen miracles and I have seen evil things, but never have I seen anything like that. Is it magic, I asked, although I smelled no magic in the air. Callum said it's nothing, a property of the light, a shadow, a reflection, no more. I see a man beside me as well. He moves as I move. I glanced back, but I saw nobody beside him. And then the little glowing man in the air faded, and the cloud, and it was day, and we were alone. We climbed all that morning, ascending. Callum's ankle had twisted the day before, and when he had slipped at the waterfall, now it swelled in front of me, swelled and went red, but his pace did not ever slow, and if he was in discomfort or pain, it did not show upon his face. I said, how long, as the dusk began to blur the edges of the world? An hour, less perhaps. We will reach the cave, and then we will sleep for the night. In the morning, you will go inside. You can bring out as much gold as you can carry, and we will make our way back to the island. I looked at him then. Gray streaked hair, gray eyes, so huge and wolfish a man, and I said, You would sleep outside the cave. I would. There are no monsters in the cave. Nothing will come out and take you in the night. Nothing that will eat us. But you should not go in till daylight. And then we rounded a rock fall, all black rocks and gray half blocking our path, and we saw the cave mouth. I said, Is that all? You expected marble pillars or a giant's cave from a gossip's fireside tales? Perhaps it looks like nothing, a hole in the rock face, a shadow, and there are no guards? No guards, only the place and what it is. A cave filled with treasure, and you are the only one who can find it? Callum laughed then like a fox's bark. The islanders know how to find it, but they're too wise to come here to take its gold. They say that the cave makes you evil, that each time you visit it, each time you enter to take gold, it eats the good in your soul so they do not enter. And is that true? Does it make you evil? No, the cave feeds on something else. Not good and evil, not really. You can take your gold, but afterwards things are... He paused. Things are flat. 
There is less beauty in a rainbow, less meaning in a sermon, less joy in a kiss. He looked at the cave mouth, and I thought I saw fear in his eyes. Less. I said, there are many for whom the lure of gold outweighs the beauty of a rainbow. Me when I was young for one, you now for another. So we go in at dawn. You will go in. I will wait for you out here. Do not be afraid. No monster guards the cave. No spells to make the gold vanish if you do not know some cat trip or ribe. We made our camp then, or rather we sat in the darkness against the cold rock wall. There would be no sleep there. I said, you took the gold from there as I will do tomorrow. You bought a house with it, a bride, a good name. His voice came from the darkness. I, they meant nothing to me once I had them, or less than nothing. And if your gold pays for the king over the water to come back to us and rule us and bring about a land of joy and prosperity and warmth, it will still mean nothing to you. It will be as something you heard of happened to a man in a tale. I have lived my life to bring the king back, I told him. He said, you take the gold back to him. Your king will want more gold because kings want more. It is what they do. Each time you come back, it will mean less. The rainbow means nothing. Killing a man means nothing. Silence then in the darkness. I heard no birds, only the wind that called and gusted about the peaks like a mother seeking her babe. I said, we have both killed men. Have you ever killed a woman, Callum McGinnis? I have not. I have killed no woman, no girls. I ran my hands over my dirk in the darkness, seeking the wood in center of the hilt, the steel of the blade. It was there in my hands. I had not intended to ever tell him, only to strike when we were out of the mountains, strike once, strike deep. But now I felt the words being pulled from me, would I or never so. They say there was a girl, I told him, and a thorn bush. Silence. The whistling of the wind. Who told you, he asked. Then, never mind, I would not kill a woman. No man of honor would kill a woman. If I said a word I knew, he would be silent on the subject and never talk about it again. So I said nothing, only waited. Callum McInnes began to speak, choosing his words with care, talking as if he was remembering a tale he had heard as a child and had almost forgotten. They told me the kind of the lowlands were fat and bonny, and that a man could gain honor and glory by adventuring off to the southlands and returning with the fine red cattle. So I went south, and never a cow was good enough, until on a hillside in the lowlands I saw the finest, reddest, fattest cows that ever a man has seen. So I began to lead them away back the way I'd come. She came after me with a stick. The cattle were her father's, she said, and I was a rogue and a knave and all manner of rough things. But she was beautiful even when angry, and had I not already a young wife, I might have dealt more kindly to her. Instead, I pulled a knife and touched it to her throat and bade her to stop speaking, and she did not stop. I would not kill her. I would not kill a woman, and that is the truth. So I tied her by her hair to a thorn tree and I took her knife from her waistband to slow her as she tried to free herself, and pushed the blade of it deep into the sod. I tied her to the thorn tree by her long hair, and I thought no more of her as I made off with her cattle. It was another year before I was back that way. I was not after cows that day, but I walked up the side of that bank. It was a lonely spot, and if you had not been looking, you might not have seen it. Perhaps nobody searched for her. I heard they searched, I told him although some believed her taken by reavers, and others believed her run away with a tinker or gone to the city, but still they searched. I, I saw what I did see. Perhaps you'd have to stood where I was standing to see what I did see. It was an evil thing I did, perhaps. Perhaps, he said. I have taken gold from the cave of the mists. I cannot tell any longer if there is good or there is evil. I sent a message by a child in an inn telling them where she was where they could find her. I closed my eyes, but the world became no darker. There is evil, I told him. I saw it in my mind's eye, her skeleton picked clean of clothes, picked clean of flesh, as naked and white as anyone would ever be, hanging like a child's puppet against the thorn bush, tied to a branch above it by its red golden hair. At dawn, said Callum McGinnis, as if we had been talking of provisions of the weather, you will leave your dirk behind for such is the custom, and you will enter the cave and bring out as much gold as you can carry, and you will bring it back with you to the mainland. 
There's not a soul in these parts knowing what you carry or where it's from would take it from you. Then send it to the king over the water, and he will pay his men with it and feed them and buy their weapons. One day he will return. Tell me on that day that there is evil, little man. When the sun was up, I entered the cave. It was damp in there. I could hear water running down the wall, and I felt a wind on my face, which was strange, because there was no wind inside the mountain. In my mind, the cave would be filled with gold. Bars of gold would be stacked like firewood, and bags of golden coins would sit between them. There would be golden chains and golden rings and golden plates heaped high like the china plates in a rich man's house. I had imagined riches, but there was nothing like that there. Only shadows, only rock. Something was here, though, something that waited. I have secrets, but there is a secret that lies beneath all my other secrets, and not even my children know it, although I believe my wife suspects, and it is this. My mother was a mortal woman, the daughter of a miller, but my father came to her out of the West, and to the West he returned when he had had a sport with her. I cannot be sentimental about my parentage. I am sure he does not think of her, and doubt that he ever knew of me. But he left me a body that is small and fast and strong, and perhaps I take after him in other ways. I do not know. I am ugly, and my father was beautiful, or so my mother told me once, but I think she might have been deceived. I wondered what I would have seen in that cave if my father had been an innkeeper from the lowlands. You'd be seeing gold, said a whisper that was not a whisper, from deep in the heart of the mountain. It was a lonely voice and, dis and distracted and bored. I would see gold, I said aloud. Would it be real or would it be an illusion? The whisper was amused. You were thinking like a mortal man, making things always to be one thing or another. It is gold they would see and touch, gold they would carry back with them, feeling the weight of it, while gold they would trade with other mortals for what they needed. What does it matter if there is or is not, if they can see it, touch it, steal it, and murder for it? Gold they need, and gold I give them. And what do you take for the gold you give them? Little enough, for my needs are few, and I am old, too old to follow my sisters into the West. I taste their pleasure and their joy. I feed a little, feed on what they do not need and do not value. A taste of heart, a lick and a nibble of their fine consciences, a sliver of soul. And in return, a fragment of me leaves this cave with them and gazes out at the world through their eyes and sees what they see until their lives are done and I take back what is mine. Will you show yourself to me? I could see in the darkness better than any man born of man and woman could see. I saw something move in the shadows and then the shadows congealed and shifted, revealing formless things at the edge of my perception where it meets imagination. Troubled, I said, a thing it is proper to say at such times, such as this, appear before me in a form that neither harms nor is offensive to me. Is that what you wish? The drip of distant water. Yes, I said. From out of the shadows it came, and it stared down at me with empty sockets, smiled at me with wind-weathered ivory teeth. It was all bone, save its hair, and its hair was red and gold, and wrapped about the branch of a thorn bush. That offends my eyes. I took it from your mind, said a whisper that sat so it surrounded the skeleton. Its jawbone did not move. I chose something you loved. This was your daughter Flora, as she was the last time you saw her. I closed my eyes, but the figure remained. It said, The reaver waits for you at the mouth of the cave. He waits for you to come out, weaponless and weighted down with gold. He will kill you and take the gold from your dead hands. But I'll not be coming out with gold, will I? I thought of Callum McGinnis, the wolf gray in his hair, the gray of his eyes, the line of his dirk. He was bigger than I am, but all men are bigger than I am. Perhaps I was stronger and faster, but he was also fast and he was strong. He killed my daughter, I thought, then wondered if the thought was mine or if it had crept out of the shadows and into my head. Aloud I said, Is there another way out of this cave? You leave the way you entered, through the mouth of my home. I stood there and did not move, but in my mind I was like an animal in a trap, questing and darting from idea to idea, finding no purchase and no solace and no solution. I said I am weaponless, 
He told me that I could not enter this place with a weapon that it was not the custom. It is the custom now to bring no weapon into my place. It was not always the custom. Follow me, said the skeleton of my daughter. I followed her, for I could see her, even when it was so dark that I could see nothing else. In the shadows it said, It is beneath your hand. I crouched and felt it. The haft felt like bone, perhaps an antler. I touched the blade cautiously in the darkness, discovered that I was holding something that felt more like an awl than a knife. It was thin, sharp at the tip. It would be better than nothing. Is there a price? There is always a price. Then I will pay it. And I ask one other thing. You say that you can see the world through his eyes. There were no eyes in that hollow skull, but it nodded. Then tell me when he sleeps. It said nothing. It melded into the darkness, and I felt alone in that place. Time passed. I followed the sound of the dripping water, found a rock pool, and drank. I soaked the last of the oats, and I ate them, chewing them until they dissolved in my mouth. I slept and woke and slept again and dreamed of my wife, Morag, waiting for me as the seasons changed, waiting for me just as we had waited for our daughter, waiting for me forever. Something, a finger, I thought, touched my hand. It was not bony and hard. It was soft and human-like, but too cold. He sleeps. I left the cave in the blue light before dawn. He slept across the cave mouth cat-like, I knew, such that the slightest touch would have woken him. I held my weapon in front of me, a bone handle and a needle-like blade of blackened silver, and I reached out and took what I was after without waking him. Then I stepped closer, and his hand grasped for my ankle and his eyes opened. "'Where's the gold?' asked Callum McGinnis. "'I have none.' The wind blew cold on the mountainside. I had danced back out of his reach when he had grabbed at me. He stayed on the ground, pushed himself onto one elbow. Then he said, "'Where's my dirk?' "'I took it,' I told him, "'while you slept.' He looked at me sleepily. "'And why ever would you do that?' I was going to kill you, I would have done it on the way here. I could have killed you a dozen times. But I did not have gold then, did I? He said nothing. I said, if you think you could have got me to bring gold from the cave, and that not bringing it out would have saved your miserable soul, then you're a fool. He no longer looked sleepy. A fool, am I? He was ready to fight. It is good to make people who are ready to fight angry. I said, not a fool, no for I have met fools and idiots, and they are happy in their idiocy, even with straw in their hair. You are too wise for foolishness. You seek only misery, and you bring misery with you, and you call down misery on all you touch. He rose then, holding a rock in his hand like an axe, and he came at me. I am small, and he could not strike me, as he would have struck a man of his own size. He leaned over to strike. It was a mistake. I held the bone haft tightly and stabbed upward, striking fast with the point of the awl like a snake. I knew the place I was aiming for, and I knew what it would do. He dropped his rock, clutched his right shoulder. My arm, he said, I cannot feel my arm. He swore then, fouling the air with curses and threats. The dawn light on the mountaintop made everything so beautiful and blue. In that light, even the blood that had begun to soak his garments was purple. He took a step back so he was between me and the cave. I felt exposed, the rising sun at my back. Why do you not have gold? he asked me. His arm hung limply at his side. There was no gold there for such as I, I said. He threw himself forward then, ran at me and kicked at me. My awl blade went flying from my hand. I threw my arms around his leg and I held on to him as together we tumbled off the mountainside. His head was above me, and I saw triumph in it, and then I saw sky, and then the valley floor was above me, and I was rising to meet it, and then it was below me, and I was falling to my death. A jar and a bump, and now we were turning over and over on the side of the mountain, the world a dizzying whirligig of rock and pain and sky, and I knew I was a dead man, but still I clung to the leg of Callum McGinnis. I saw a golden eagle in flight, but below me or above me, I could no longer say. It was there in the dawn sky, in the shattered fragments of time and perception, there in the pain. I was not afraid. There was no time and no space to be afraid in, no space in my mind and no space in my heart. 
I was falling through the sky, holding tightly to the leg of a man who was trying to kill me. We were crashing into rocks, scraping and bruising, and then we stopped. Stopped with force enough that I felt myself jarred, and was almost thrown off Callum McInnes and to my death beneath. The side of the mountain had crumbled there long ago, sheared off, leaving a sheet of blank rock as smooth and featureless as glass. But that was below us. Where we were, there was a ledge. And on the ledge, there was a miracle. Stunted and twisted high above the tree line, where no trees have any right to grow, was a twisted hawthorn tree, not much larger than a bush, although it was old. Its roots grew into the side of the mountain, and it was this hawthorn that had caught us in its gray arms. I let go of the leg, clambered off Callum McInnes's body and onto the side of the mountain. I stood on the narrow ledge and looked down at the sheer drop. There was no way down from here, no way down at all. I looked up. It might be possible, I thought, climbing slowly with fortune on my side to make it up that mountain. If it did not rain, if the wind was not too hungry, and what choice did I have? The only alternative was death. A voice. So, will you leave me here to die, dwarf? I said nothing. I had nothing to say. His eyes were open. He said, I cannot move my right arm since you stabbed it. I think I broke a leg in the fall. I cannot climb with you. I said, I may succeed or I may fail. You'll make it. I've seen you climb. After you rescued me crossing that waterfall, you went up those rocks like a squirrel going up a tree. I did not have his confidence in my climbing abilities. He said, swear to me by all you hold holy, swear by your king who waits over the sea as since we have drove his subjects from this land. Swear by the things you creatures hold dear. Swear by shadows and eagle feathers and by silence, swear that you will come back for me. You know what I am, I said. I know nothing, he said, only that I want to live. I thought. I swear by these things, I told him. By shadows and by eagle feathers and by silence. I swear by green hills and standing stones I will come back. I would have killed you, said the man in the hawthorn bush, and he said it with humor as if this was the biggest joke that ever one man had told another. I had planned to kill you and take the gold back as my own. I know. His hair framed his face like a wolf-gray halo. There was red blood on his cheek where he had scraped it in the fall. You could come back with ropes, he said. My rope is still up there by the cave mouth, but you'd need more than that. Yes, I said, I will come back with ropes. I looked up at the rock above us, examined it as best I could. Sometimes good eyes mean the difference between life and death if you're a climber. I saw where I would need to be as I went, the shape of my journey up the face of the mountain. I thought I could see the ledge outside the cave from which we had fallen as we fought. I would head for there, yes. I blew on my hands to dry the sweat before I began to climb. I will come back for you, I said, with ropes. I have sworn. When, he asked, and he closed his eyes. In a year, I told him. I will come here in a year. I began to climb. The man's cries followed me as I stepped and crawled and squeezed and hauled myself up the side of that mountain, mingling with the cries of the great raptors. And they followed me back from the misty isle, with nothing to show for my pains and my time. And I will hear him screaming at the edge of my mind, as I fall asleep or in the moments before I wake until I die. It did not rain, and the wind gusted and plucked at me, but did not throw me down. I climbed, and I climbed in safety. When I reached the ledge, the cave entrance seemed like a darker shadow in the noonday sun. I turned away from it, turned my back on the mountain, and from the shadows that were already gathering in the cracks and crevices deep inside my skull, and I began my slow journey away from the misty isle. There were a hundred roads and a thousand paths that would take me back to my home in the lowlands, where my wife would be waiting.